Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I feel honored to be here to hang out with you guys. Um, in exchanging views on how to manage the mind for sustainable success. Why sustainable success? Because a lot of people have attained success, have achieved their goals, have accomplished their goals in life. But because of problems with the mind, because of issues having to do with the mind, they lost their credibility, they lost their jobs. And in the global arena, in the 21st century, we have more and more people, leaders in the global village who have sold out their credibility because of uh, inability to be able to manage the mind and the sense of other sense of modalities. 970 million people on, on global statistics have problems with the mind. This is according to uh, 2021 statistics by the Department of Statistics. 970 million people in the globe. So when we want to make a presentation or we want to conduct a research, the first question that comes to mind is, what is the problem you're trying to solve? Is there any problem? Or are you a paratologist? A palatologist is someone who simply makes some recitations, recites some things he or she has learned. He downloads it to the, uh, uh, for the audience to have you know, a sense of uh, perception and for him to have a sense of humor. So we are about redirecting a misdirected civilization. And this misdirection of our modern civilization is rooted in the fact that we do not have the appropriate technologies to manage our minds. I know very well how uh, the past governor of New York was very you know, very productive. He was just an accomplished guy. And I love the way he handled issues. 
Unfortunately, he lost his job. They kicked him out. Why? Because of inability to deal with the sensory modalities, including the mind. So it's a big problem in the global village. The mind issue is a big problem. Mental issues, is the big problems. And so uh, this sharing and caring on this topic becomes relevant. That's a problem. And we need to address it. So what does success mean to you? A number of you are doing your graduate programs, or you're finished, or working, or you're professors. But, you know, the whole idea is that, especially in the academia or in the ivory towers, it is essentially important that we begin to think about creating a viable future that will be sustainable. We have accomplished, and so these accomplishments should be sustainable because we may end up having to man uh, different organizations or even be involved in developing people or communities or our constituencies. But what about managing our own mind? If we don't, if we don't manage our minds effectively, it becomes very difficult to even manage our families. It becomes difficult to manage our societies or our organizations because we have to remove the speck in our eyes so as to be able to see the problems that are there in the settings that we are being placed. And so these very topics uh, for me, it's very relevant because I've seen cases where our people have even become mentally deranged because of initial issues that having to do with lack of appropriate strategies to be able to address the sankalpa and vilkalpa of their minds. The mind is characterized by sankalpa and vilkalpa. This is Sanskrit terminology, Sanskrit, or oh, you, you are Indian boys and girls, so you know, you know Sanskrit. <laughs> the mind is characterized by Sankalpa and Vikalpa, accepting one thing now and rejecting that same thing the very next moment. Ah. Lao, Lao Tzu, he mentions that he emphasized the need for us to watch our thoughts. Because these thoughts, they, they facilitate actions. And we also need to be very careful about our actions because these actions, they give rise ultimately to our character because they give rise to habits and habits to character. And so what we feed the mind, I mean, it's like, you know, putting a cassette in a tape, um, uh, putting some information in the tape recorder or in a digital system. And when you, when you own it, that's the information you get. So whatever we feed the mind is what ultimately we are going to get. Uh, Modern science is insufficiently equipped with technologies on how to curb the excesses of the mind, how to deal with the misgivings of the mind. And according to your own literature, your own Hindu literature, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna mentioned that an uncontrolled mind is our worst enemy. Can you imagine how you going to how are you going to manage your mind when at every moment you have billions of thoughts flooding the mind? So we have a problem, and we think that we have, and we think that we have an enemy 
But the mind that is not being managed properly is our worst enemy. So think about it. If you want to be successful in, a, in your career, you need some concentration, some sustained concentration in whatever you are doing. Now, according to psychological research, about 20 to 50% of our daily thoughts are distracted. <laughs> we may be here listening to this discussion, to this talk, but our minds could swap or sweep to Delhi. And our minds are in Delhi, enjoying life. Physically, we are here. <laughs> but the professor may be in the class. <laughs> professor may be in the class giving, you know, presenting very, something very salient to your educational development. And the mind jumps up. He goes everywhere. The mind is in London. From India to London, he just sweep. The mind moves. And before you know, time has elapsed. This is the element we have to deal with. The mind is one of the subtle elements that constitutes, constitutes the body. We have our subtle body and the physical body. The physical body is made up of earth, water, air, ether, well, earth, water, fire, air, it's five elements. And the subtle body, what we experience in the dream state is the subtle body, which is carrying the, the life force or the spirit soul. And that, that subtle body constitutes of the mind, the intelligence, and the ego. Now, the sages of yours, the sages of India, have documented all of the important features of the mind, the impact of the mind on society, the impact of the mind on our thought patterns and behavior. So, if we are the experience of being distracted when we are studying, as you know, people in academia, Study is your watchword. As a researcher, study is our watchword. That is our hobby. That is our job and our hobby. Study. But when you study, how many times you have the distraction, your mind jumps off the table and travels far, far, far away, leaving you there. And so, this is something very relevant to our everyday reality as academics. We need to address this. And that is why we're here today to share some essential strategies, cost effective strategies that will facilitate our being able to tame the mind, to tame the mind, to domesticate the mind. Right now, we are being controlled by the mind. And there is nothing we can do about it. But if we understand that the mind is a material element, and the material element is not superior to spiritual reality, we can use spiritual strategies to be able to manage the mind. And so, being that the mind is part of the subtle body, and everybody has got a mind, every embodied soul has got a mind, and the mind has, the mind has been accompanying us, the same mind has been accompanying us for billions and billions of lifetimes. So the mind monitors us, he knows, the mind knows our weaknesses. Uh, one of those challenges as a young teenager growing up was having to be exposed to celebrities who advocate that we should be followers of the mind. 
But you can be, a, there's, there's leadership and there's followership. Uh, there was one of these uh, celebrities. He was very famous in, I mean, uh, in the music industry in those, uh, in those, in those uh, times, when we were kids. His name is Jimmy Cliff. Have you heard of Jimmy Cliff? Most of you, when he was alive, when he was, you know, at the apex of affairs, you were not born. But Jimmy Cliff, he debuted an album and the major track that attracted the whole, the major uh, event of that album was titled, Follow My Mind. In the lyrics, he mentioned, he was advocating, he was preaching <laughs> that, you know what, hey boys and girls, you know what you have to do to be successful, to be happy, just follow your mind. Whatever your mind tells you, just follow it. Whatever dictates you have from your mind, just follow it. And we love that music like anything in those days. We thought, wow, what a wonderful innovation. I just follow my mind. And, you know, I will never go wrong. Yeah, this is his words. If, we, if, if, if I follow my mind, I will never go wrong. So I had imbibed that culture of Jimmy Cliff's philosophy. And when I was exposed to the Bhagavad Gita, <laughs> it was completely, Krishna, Lord Krishna presented completely the opposite. This is how we get depraved, derailed from our part of spiritual justice. When we get into the Western hemisphere, the Western philosophies, the Western ideologies. And Jimmy Cliff is from uh, South, South America, there. Uh, from some of these islands, I think uh, one of these islands in South America. So we love that music like anything because we can understand, we can relate with it, that just follow whatever your mind tells you. And that very phenomenon, that concept is still going on. It's very dominant in today's 21st century among the old and the youth. So we have a problem. And that problem is that of how to navigate through with the art of managing the mind. A lot of people don't even know what constitutes their embodiment? Oh, yeah. You think everybody knows that their body is made up of air, water, fire, intelligence, and false ego, five gross elements, and three subtle elements? And those subtle, those subtle elements are the carriers of the real living force, the spirit soul. No. This philosophy is only available in India. And you have the privilege to be exposed to these ideologies and make hay while the sun shines. So, as members of the academia, yeah, in the uh, ivory towers, what's the relevance of this topic to you? It is very important for you to understand how not to become a slave to the mind or the understanding modalities. Literally speaking, every one of us on the planet is a slave to the mind. We are slaves to the mind. So I'll give you a gross example. Here, there was a female teacher. And her husband was the principal of the of the of the school. She was teaching there, high school. And in America, if you have sex with anyone who is below 18, especially under your care, it's called statutory rape. Whether the both of you, there was consensus, that does not count. That doesn't count. It's rape. So this lady, beautiful lady, she was attracted to one of these students, 17 years old. So they were texting. They were arranging to go out for sex. 
And then later she, she, she realized that, hey, if I get caught, I'll go to jail. So she tells the boy, blah, 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 blah. hey, stop. You know, if I get caught, I'll go to jail. One would have thought, oh, she realized it. But the mind dictates, go for it. Come on, go for it. Come on, you must go for it. <laughs> so she wrote to the boy, hey, let's get out. So they went out. They had fun. But you know what? The boy came back. The boy came back. And then he started, you know, very openly bragging to, to the girls in, 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 his, in his class. And then the girls, they got fired up with envy. They went to report the matter to the authorities. And that's how they called the police for this lady. That's the end of her job. She went to jail. She lost her husband. Lost her job, and she served jail term. This is the power of the mind. The mind can create trouble for us, like anything. The mind dictates to us, and if we don't understand, we may, we may think, "Oh, this is an this is an intuitive thought." No, it's not an intuitive thought. And so, we need to understand the workings of the mind in our conditioned state right now. The mind always dictates to us. And the mind is always vying for supremacy over our whole affair. Yes, there is intelligence for discrimination. That intelligence is like a, oh, a meek, humble guy. I mean, it's like you have two kids in the home. And one of them is, you know, is tough. The older one, He's just humble and slim. And so sometimes the younger one who is tough, he overpowers it. <laughs> he overpowers the older, <laughs> the older kid. <laughs> that is how the mind works. Intelligence could discriminate that no, this is not good. This, this decision is not good. But then the mind takes over like a bully, takes over control, and then we get into trouble. And so, what to do about this uh, horrendous nature of the mind? What to do? Our success is depending on how determined we are in our efforts to, uh, to attain our pre uh, predetermined goals. But even when you attain your goals, say, you got a job with the, uh, with the United Nations, or you got a job like Strauss Kahn with the International Monetary Fund. He became the director of International, Strauss Kahn became director of International Monetary Fund. He was, he's from France. But he traveled to, to New York, and in the hotel, he got into trouble. His mind put him into trouble. <laughs> Again, the mind. The mind. So, he lost his job. He, they put him in jail. Any problem we can think of that we get involved in is simply because of the lack of ability for us in taming the mind, in managing the mind effectively. We allow the mind to manage us. We allow the mind to control us. And therefore, we run into different types of pro problems. Look, for instance, these days there is, you know, a whole globalization and a whole digitalization. There are electronic gadgets all over the place. I know of so many students who have failed their courses because of addiction to internet, the mind. They know this is not this is going this is going to create a setback in my career. But the mind, you know, pushes them. The mind impels them, they are impelled by the mind. And before they know, they are in problem. So being able to control the mind, being able to direct, control, and organize the activities of the mind. 
for sustainable success becomes a simple norm in our daily lives. Because it's essentially managing the mind implies organizing, like we have in management, planning, organizing, controlling. So planning, organizing, controlling the activities of the mind for sustainable success, that constitutes mind management. So anybody here can do it with a cost-effective approach, cost-effective methodologies. And one of those things we need to keep in mind is that what we feed our minds become a source of inspiration for the mind to create some dictations for us. I'll take, take for example, if we have taken passionate foods in the mode of passion, the mind will have that like, you know, like an impetus. It will be fed to us via the dictates of the mind. And therefore, we find that, for instance, the cow is very sober. The cow is very sober compared to the lion or compared to the dog. The cow eats vegetables. And so what we eat affects our consciousness. And if we have the habit of eating only foods in the mood of goodness, that will help to facilitate a resistance to the, to, the, to the dictates of the mind. Otherwise, we are gone. And keep in mind, we are not allowed to abuse anyone. Internationally, it's a, it's a, global, a global law. Abuse is not allowed. The only person we are allowed to abuse, and there are different types of abuses. If you ignore someone, it's an abuse. They say you are in home with your family, and then you stop talking to your mom because she offended you the other day. Or you stop talking to your dad because he said something to you the other day. And this happens in the past. When you ignore someone, it's an emotional abuse. Now, the only individual, the only entity you can ignore, is which is permitted, is the mind. You can abuse the mind. You can ignore the mind. The mind dictates something to you. You, you should wait on the scale of checks and balance whether this is something that is going to help me in my career. If it is not, you should ignore the mind. And it's just some psychological process, thought process. We overview the activities of the mind. I will find that in most cases, the mind creates and awareness all the time for sense gratification. And the mind is the chief of the sensory modalities, is the king of the sensory modalities, is the controller of all the other working senses and uh, knowledge acquiring senses. He's a big guy. And therefore, if you are dealing with a big guy, you have to be equipped with sufficient resources. And so the resources that we seek are the different technologies we could use. And one of those interventions is particularly, uh, that's what I use every day for the past 39 years. And I call it Sonic Therapeutic Intervention, the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. I've been doing this for practically 39 years. And it has transformed my life. So the mind that dictates something, it's not that the mind wouldn't dictate something to me, but the mind that takes something to me, I say, oh, you, you, you're welcome. Thank you, sir. And then I'll just ignore and go away. <laughs> so this mantra is something that has transformed so many people. So many hippies in America, pot heads, were transformed to ghost swamis by the implementation of the use of this mantra in their lives. And so, look at, just sit back and look at me. 
I belong to the minority on this on this globe. And in, in, in all spheres, I'm a minority. On the globe, on the global, uh, in the global village, we have just one percent of the eight billion people, one percent who are PhDs. We have very few people, few people who are blacks on this planet. <laughs> Ah, we have also very few people who are Vaishnavas on this planet, people who are called cultivating the Indian uh, Vaishnavism of the Indian tradition. Very few people. Even in India here, there are so many religious, there's so much of religious diversity or spiritual diversity, but the Vaishnavas, they're pretty few because their regiments are so tough. People don't want to be part of that system. When something is tough, I mean, it's like, you know, going to graduate school is tough. Not everyone will have the appropriate, the required GPA to go to graduate school. So there's, you know, a limited number of people who go to graduate school. So I've been, I, I recognize myself as a minority, but with that being said, I have been participating, I've been practicing this system. And it has transformed my life to a very great degree. In terms of even my academic career, I remember when, when I was doing my PhD, uh, there was a course we, are, uh, we, we enrolled and we were working on. That was on uh, quantitative, quantitative reasoning and analysis. And that is statistics, PhD level statistics. And I had not done, I had left statistics for like over 10 years back. And it was so difficult. But you know what? Every morning I would just chant this mantra. <laughs> it has a, the, one of the side effects is that it gives you a better concentration. The purpose is to attain pure love for divinity or pure love for God. But the side effects are so amazing. One of the side effects is concentration on what you're doing. Another side effect is to be able to control yourself, control the senses. Another side effect is, positive side effect is, it gives you internal happiness and external happiness. And so when we were doing this, uh, this uh, course, it was so difficult. Uh, my only savior was this mantra. I would chant every morning, and I feel, I feel refreshed. What, when I go to read the course, I see, I see that you know, I have a better understanding than the previous time. And you know what? We are like, uh, Eleven students in that class. All of the rest, the rest of the students, they collaborated, and this professor, <laughs> he detected that they collaborated and they canceled their works. He was a good professor because, ultimately speaking, that is a violation of academic integrity. They should have been expelled from the school, but he did not. He used his discretion. So I'm just relating to you what personally I have gained from. This sonic particle intervention in terms of sustainable development, it's in terms of sustainable career growth. And therefore, you have a chance to be able to figure out what to do with your life in terms of how to tame or how to manage the mind and the sensory modalities. Because life is short. We have just about 100 years on this planet. And whatever time we waste or whatever problem we get into, we will not regain that time. And therefore, it is important for us to think on how to utilize every opportunity we have to be able to develop ourselves in our careers, develop academically, so that at the end of the day, we feel comfortable about our decision. We, will, we feel uh, very much at peace with ourselves and with our constituency, we become role models for others to be able to come to and say, please tell me how I can deal with my restless mind. The mind is like a stubborn child. A stubborn child, you tell the child, uh, go in there, sit down there. That's the time they get to. So, <laughs> we 
we don't we don't really understand how complex and complicated our lives are until we come to real we come to study the nature of the mind and the complexities of the mind and the challenges that the mind poses on our career. Western culture, Western medicine does not have a remedy for managing the mind. They may say biofeedback, but biofeedback has nothing to do with taming the mind. It has nothing to do with managing the mind. It has to do with physical organs that could be monitored, like your heart, your brain, or whatever. Nothing to do with the mind. So you guys are lucky. You have this knowledge about how to utilize your own traditional scriptures, your own traditional technologies in revamping your own lives for a sustainable future, to be able to maintain and hold on to your career until you resign from your job, until you retire from your job. People have been kicked out every year and then in the West. Even Trump was impeached a number of times in America. Again, the mind. Lack of mind management. And so we will like that you sit back and review the whole of this talk. Process this presentation. Process our ideas. Because this has to do with your own culture. And if you deem it confident, why not? You can start practicing the tradition that you belong to, you can start practicing the use of sound vibrations to be able to revamp your capabilities and especially in reawakening your consciousness and in taming or managing the restless mind. So the word is enough for the wise. Any comments or questions? Yes. You talk a lot about money. So my question is, yes. my question is, what mind is searching for? And uh, what is the limitation? What is the mind searching for? What is the limitation of the mind? The mind is searching for self gratification. Sense gratification, gratification of the sensory modalities. The mind is the chief of the sensory modalities, and the whole of its activities is geared towards gratification of the sensory modalities and to be able to enable us to stay in this material arena to enjoy sense gratification and undergo repeated birth and death. That is the major objective of the mind. The limitation is that we can break out from the influence of that of the mind by using the higher self to deal with the lower self. And that practice is very much available in the Bhakti Yoga system as prescribed in the Bhagavad Gita. And basically, Every material element does have a limitation. Even the whole of the physical body has a limitation. And so the mind also has a limitation. And we can do one thing in a way that will also help the mind. That is by engaging in sonic therapeutic intervention that helps to purify the mind. And instead of we becoming sub, uh, sub subjective or becoming controlled by the mind, we can use our purified system to be able to subdue, tame, and manage the mind effectively. Does it make sense? I have one more question. Feel free. Regarding the use of sound vibrations, what is the sense gratification? Sense free. Sensory gratification, the gratification of the senses. Take to your example of giving the teacher is sexually attracted towards it. 
a student and the, I mean the law is something like 18 years, below 18 years. Law is made by your people. And uh, if something made by your people might be wrong for some other people. <laughs> and it's a self gratification or their enjoyment or if there is no law, it will be a right thing or a wrong thing. And it is not controlled if things are not controlled by law. Things are controlled by a human desire, the human mind. And might be human can go beyond this thing, their senses and their feelings. Well, uh, human beings can go beyond the senses and their feelings? Yeah. Of course, you can control your senses and your feelings by deed of following a purificatory system. If the senses, if the senses and the mind become purified, you will not be subjected to the whims of the mind and the senses. This is the position of the ghost swamis. The difference is there is a ghost swami and there is a godasa. The mind enables us to be the godasas, being subject to the senses and the mind. The ghost swami, they control the senses and the mind. So we have that opportunity, we have that chance to be able to elevate ourselves, elevate our consciousness, and the desires of the mind, we will not become susceptible to the desires of the mind. We will not become uh, induced by the dictates of the mind. We will not become inflamed by the dictates. Yes, we can transcend. Why not? That is, you see that in your own uh, historiography, the sages, people like Nada, uh, Lord Shiva, so many other people, or so many other uh, beings, they practice meditation and they have control over themselves, not only over themselves, even over their environment. So yes, this is something very practical. You don't really want to get into the problems that others have gotten into. Now in the West, they don't, they don't have this type of facility. They don't have this type of information, spiritual information culture. And therefore, there are laws, there are laws, but you can only make laws. You, the laws don't reform people. The laws don't reform people. I have, you know, when I was a child, I went to watch people being uh, facing firing squad in the public in the stadium. For what? For armed robbery. Money. Now, when we are leaving the, the stadium, as a kid, when we are leaving the stadium, I saw the police they caught people stealing, picking pockets right at the gates when they have just seen people executed, killed for arm robbery, for stealing. It, it didn't stop them from stealing. So it is only when the mind becomes purified through some practical methodologies, some sadhana, that we can transcend the desires, the influence of the desires of the mind and the senses. Otherwise, it's very, it becomes very difficult. We may, there is a, 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 common, a common slogan in the Vedic, Vedic technology. It says, a share of fear, no partiality. Even after seeing, <laughs> that was a typical case, even after, even after seeing that people have been executed for stealing, they were stealing at the gate and they were apprehended. Yes, that we can transcend that. That is the whole idea of the Vedic culture. Training and practice. Practice and training will, will enable us to become free from the bondage to the mind. Yes. Very nice, very nice point. Yeah. Yes. You can, you can give on. We become conditioned with certain events, right? So, at a certain point of time, it feels that the mind is going completely against us. How can we recondition our mind so that it listens to what I want right now? Uh -huh. That's a very nice point. How to recondition the mind so that if the mind will just align with me for me to be able to achieve my goals sustainably. 
Yeah, reconditioning of the mind is when spiritual practices come in. When spiritual practices, when you get involved in spiritual practices, that is a, a process of reconditioning the mind. And when the mind becomes purified, the mind becomes your best friend. <laughs> right now, it's a what enemy? Because it's trying to control, it's detecting, and we don't have the resistance. You know, any change initiative you take, there are bound to be elements of resistance. So if, <laughs> if the mind, if the mind poses a lot of resistance in our attempts to become transformed or in our attempts to even tame it, which is just the persistent, and in due course of time, it absorbs the purification, it undergoes the purification, when the mind becomes purified, that same mind which is our enemy presently becomes our best friend. That's what is stated also in your own books, the Bhagavad Gita. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, that's a nice question. A very spiritually deep question. <laughs> Thank you. How many times shall we, you talking about the education of our mantra, how many times shall we do it? Well, how much time is involved? Now, as someone who is fully engaged in academia, what happens if I tell you what I do, that would be bizarre. Because some days it's difficult for me to even sleep because I have to do conduct research, research, research for presentation and publications. And I have to also engage in chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra for which is a particular time frame. I use like one and a half hours to chant every day out of the 24 hours. So you use any time that you want to use, but you will see results. I remember in, in New York at Columbia University, there was one of my, you know, my mentees who was pulling there and she told me a story. It's an Indian girl who was practicing chanting. And she was uh, having a, a Chinese girl who was a roommate. And this Chinese girl, she's reading economics. This Indian girl is, uh, was reading a, was doing engineering. And so one, it was exam period. And the Chinese girl just came back from class. And she told this Indian girl, oh, I'm stretched out. I'm dying. I'm dying. I'm dying. So she got scared. She held the, the, the friend, the roommate, and said, what's going on? She says, he's just too stretched out. Yeah, the girls offer that. Why don't you try this mantra that I'm chanting every morning that you hear me chant? So she said, yeah, she can try. And then the girl gave the beast to her. She showed her how to do it. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. Just once, once, chatted just once. The girl said, I feel better. <laughs> she said, I feel better. So she said, all right. Yeah. Her friend said, try again. Try one more. And then she chanted. And then she felt, each time she chanted, she said she felt better. So the girl enabled her to use her own rosary, her beads, to chant one round, 108. Uh, uh, times the holy names. And you know what the Chinese girl said? She said, oh, I feel completely okay. That is just some few minutes of therapy. And it happened not thousands of years ago, just right here in this century, at this few, few years back at Columbia University. So, and there are a number of tested researches on this mantra. For instance, some um, Chennai professors, they conducted, they use this mantra to conduct the research on stress reduction on uh, nursing personnel. And they found that it was uh, very positive. It has a positive effect on reducing uh, stress. There are researches that have been conducted in terms of uh, using this mantra 
to uh, to create a positive change in people with depression, and it's been it's been documented. So yes, you use your time. Whether you want to use initially, you want to use fifteen minutes, you want to use thirty minutes to do it. It's up to you. But the best thing for you, if you get a rosary, that it creates a, a more impact. Yeah, it's a good. So we have some 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 ladies here. You can meet her. Uh, she's an ophthalmologist, uh, Dr. Adeva Huti. You can meet her, and she will pass you through the system. Okay, thank you. Yes. And then event in our mind, we are thinking, and all the logic are with that event. Subconsciously, we don't want that event to happen in our life. So how can we stay strong to our subconscious mind so that it really doesn't matter in our life? Yeah. First of all, thank you. It's a nice question. No, the mind operates on different levels. The subconscious, like you rightly mentioned, and the conscious. And so, see, we are the creators of our own fortune. So, if we want something in our lives, we should just focus on that. And it will come to pass. Now, if we want a failure, we want, or want to get sick, we should just be thinking negatively. <laughs> we should just be thinking negatively all the time. And very soon we get we get the, all the problems. So the bad, one of the uh, uh, positive approaches is to remain positive all the time, to think positive. You don't want a particular thing which is cropping up in your subconscious mind. Ignore it. It just completely ignore it. Yeah, ignore it. But, huh? Ignore that uh, that thought. Yeah, that you don't want it. Yeah. Yeah. So just the thought may come. I mean, it's like there are so many, so many thoughts flowing into our consciousness, flowing into our mind. As they go in, if you don't if you don't begin to worship the those thoughts like a deity, they will also flow out. So just ignore. Okay. Yeah. That's the system. You just ignore it, ignore those dictates. Just ignore. It's called an abuse. Abuse, abuse those negative thoughts. Don't just, don't just mind them. They will go. They will go away. Okay. Yes. So, according to you, uh, chanting is the only solution for controlling mind. Or... No, no, no. It's not the only solution. There are other, there are other different uh, strategies. I mentioned also about diet therapy. Based on the type of food we eat, the mind acts accordingly. So if we are eating food in the bone of passion or, you know, too much of spicy food, say we are eating something that is like pepperish, it inflames the mind and then it acts in that positivity, in that way, and uh, it, the, the intensity of the disturbances could become uh, increased. And so we have to regulate also what, in terms of what we eat. If we eat food in the mode of goodness, the mind will not bother us. So much. But if we eat in the food in the mode of passion and ignorance, yeah, it's just like fueling a car. Yeah. What exactly happening behind this chanting that helps to control all this? Ah, uh, the what is happening behind this chanting? This chanting are the names of the Supreme Personality of God, eh? who is all spiritual, who is all pure, Pavitra. And so we have a problem because we are impure, we are contaminated by so many material elements, so many material desires, negative thoughts, etc. And so these holy names are the, the, that they are not different from the personality of God. And so when we associate with the holy name, and it's like it's like fire, okay? If you put any wood into the fire, if the wood burns into ashes. So in the same way. Our negative thoughts, our negative ideas, our impurities are born to ashes when we associate with the all pure name of the Supreme Personality of God. That's very nice points. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, any other comments? Okay. Okay. So, it's going to do what? Hare Krishna Mantra. If we chant this every day, we feel uh, enhanced. But if that is true, uh, in India, 
most of the Brahmins use uh, always daily they want to chant uh, many mantras and even the Gayatri Mantra every day. Then why don't they feel uh, good about uh, good in their lives? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, when I was at, I, I, I just came back from uh, uh, ben Bengaluru, okay? So I was at Biocon, Biocon, the largest uh, uh, Indian biopharmaceutical uh, industry. I, I gave a talk there, and one of the one of the questions that was, uh, one of the comments that were raised was that, oh, these, there are different mantras in, in the Vedic literature, for instance, the Om. And then this guy, he said that, Chanting the Om, can you listen? The chanting the Om is deep. Chanting the Hare Krishna Mantra, he said it's joyful. That's according to him. Okay, so the point is that those who are regularly chanting, they have the experience. Like I just gave you an instance about this Chinese girl at Columbia University who chanted just for a few minutes and she got relieved from her stress uh, on campus. And so people chant so many mantras, but we have to look at the effects on our lives. We have to look at how those mantras have modified our behavior. I don't chant so many mantras. I chant Gayatri mantra to help me to even concentrate more on the chanting of the Hare Krishna Maha mantra. I chant the uh, Panchatatwa, Jaya Krishna Chaitanya Prabhupada Chananda, Advaita Gdara, Siva Sari, Gaurav Bhaktavinda, to beg for uh, the Panchatatwa as mercy, the most magnificent incarnation of the Lord, Lord Chaitanya Prabhu. I beg for his mercy to allow me to chant Krishna's name, the holy names of the Lord. And those are just what I do the rest of my day. I engage in research, writing, developing ideas, and you know, traveling to be able to help people to create a positive change in their lives. And I've seen even practically from my own life. I was not born in India. I have been doing this for like 39 years. So think about I have skills that other people have there. I could be doing something else. But I said, no, this is what I have to do for the rest of my life. So that is something that is credible. There's something that is really uh, important there that I choose to do. Yeah. And one more question is, uh, uh, you know, was saying of meditation, like uh, chanting Hare Krishna mantra, mantra is also under meditation. So, uh, in this, uh, there is ambiguity here. Like, somebody says that meditation is about uh, having no thoughts. But during chanting of Hare Krishna mantra, we are focusing on more uh, uh, thoughts and ideas on uh, Bhagavan Sri Krishna. So, what is the, uh, this, uh, Misconceptions. Oh, there's no misconception there, but there is uh, a misidentification of the definition of meditation. Meditation means to, you know, concentrate your mind on a lovable object, or to saturate your mind, saturate your consciousness with a love with a lovable object, and that lovable object is God, Krishna, Rama, whatever you name it. Ah. When people chant Krishna's name or the chant the Maha Mantra, in the beginning, there could be, the mind still could create some distractions. But as you practice, generally speaking, you find that you become focused. And whatever you're doing, we have seen, I conducted some research some years ago on undergraduate students who have been chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. And what I found was that Prior to these students getting involved in the chanting, they, we have their grades record, recorded. And the period that they were chanting, their grades were higher than the period that they were not chanting. Because the chanting helps to create a better concentration as one of the positive side effects. That is not the goal of the chanting. The goal is to attain pure love for Krishna, pure love for God. But any intervention you undergo or any therapy you under, undergo, there are bound to be some side effects. Like if you undergo some chem chemotherapy, there is bound to be some uh, you know, uh, you know, powerful side effects. But the side effects of chanting these holy names are positive side effects. And so concentration is one of them. And that is why we'll find that in that research, the students' grades were higher 
when the period that we are chanting compared to the period that we are not chanting. So yeah, there's no ambiguity there. Point is that it's a simple thing that when you begin the subject matter, when you, if, 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 in fact, when you start your studies as a graduate student, your first year of enrollment, the first courses you, you embark, it could be very confusing. But you know, with time, you get adjusted, you get used to it, you get used to the technologies of the professors and all this stuff. So that's how it works. All right, yeah. Mm -hmm. I have one practical question which I have seen in the college life so far. Like, uh, I came here and I have seen uh, one culture like uh, people are very much focused on Western culture, like smoking and <laughs> drinking. And it is like, it seems them very much cool, but there are a few students like me and you know, more that we don't even want to touch it. Like, uh, I have a question that we both know that this thing is bad for health, bad for mind, but one is willing to have it and one is don't even willing to think about it. So what is the difference between both of them? Mm. Yeah. When we know, thank you for your nice question. When we know something, this is not good for my health. And have, 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 I, I had an encounter with one professor. When I was younger, I had an encounter with one professor uh, she's a female white professor in uh, in London, and so she, that was going to go for the uh, presentation of their conference. So we we're discussing, and then uh, you know, in the along the, the discussion, one day I said, "So can you do something for me?" She said, "Yes, yes. Ask me anything, I'll do for you." I said, "Can you stop smoking for me?" <laughs> and you know what she told me. <laughs> You know what she told me? She said, I can't stop smoking for anybody. <laughs> I said, but there are, there are side effects, health hazards associated with smoking. She said she knows. That she goes for medical checkup every year. <laughs> so, yeah, it's a pity. People, people know this is something hazardous to their health. And they do it again because of the mind. They have dog, the mind is dog. They're not able to control the mind. So the mind becomes the controller. They become slaves to the mind. I know this thing is going to kill me. And then I say, well, I'm not going to stop for anybody. So by practicing sadhana, we get the willpower to be able to, so, to say no to the dictates of the mind. We can become Goswamis, controllers of the sensory modalities. And our sustainable success is rest assured. Yes. Uh, sustainable success means that we have, attained our, we have accomplished our goals, we are put in a good position, and we want to maintain that for the rest of our career. We want to rest for the rest of our life. And sustainability in this sense implies that we are successful, but we are put in a position based on our success value. At the same time, we don't do anything that will hurt people's life. That will hurt people's feelings. Because the tendency is we are good, we are we are in a good position and we don't care how we behave. We act in whimsical ways to hurt other people. Because when people feel hurt, we get some reactions. This is why some of the global leaders they run out of space, they fall off the track because they, they hurt so many people, and those hurtful feelings come back as a reaction to their lives and destroy them. So sustainability also implies here doing things that will create a viable future that will make people happy, even for people yet to be born. Leave a legacy behind that will enable people yet to be born to be happy because of their policies. All right. Uh, okay. Last question. Yes. Uh, 
there are so many negative as well. Negative experiences or negative things happen to me or the students. So my mind controls when something similar is going to happen in So those instructions were stopping me from uh, trusting somebody or even my family. So for example, I need to speak something. So it seems to be so these kind I don't try to speak. Me, you know, crazy or driving me crazy because I don't want to go again again. Or I don't want to say, or I don't want to get feelings again. Years ago. So, my, my, so, or maybe that is negative emotion. I would like to call it negative emotion because that is creating, you know, uh, uh, what would I say? Uh, that is again, <laughs> uh, you know, giving me the negative vibes. I would say, I, I would like to call it like five. Uh, thinking of it again and again, maybe it won't happen again, but uh, that's your perspective. Or even telling at my family because it happens. Yeah, I love this meditation. So, but definitely in my dream, I will have it. So, that thought let me let me. Give me. So, he is the negative thing from God. Thank you very much. That is a very uh, deep, uh, deep question. Yeah, sometimes we may be involved in living some spiritual practices, and then we experience uh things that are not favorable to our growth or to our conscious upliftment. And uh, it doesn't mean that what you're doing is not proper, what you're doing is not correct. It's just that sometimes we have so much of baggage in the past. And so it's heavily loaded and sometimes the 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 effect is being diminished or being run down just by uh, a dream experience. Instead of you to have a physical, a physical experience, a physical pain, the effect of your meditations has created an amelioration to that effect that it, you, you only have some perturbation of some disturbance through dream. And so you are properly situated. It happens with especially people who have a heavy loaded karma. If you are performing spiritual activities, it's like you're going through a crash program. A crash program means that, you know, the program that is supposed to take you seven years, you're doing it in two years. So you're overloaded. But if you endeavor to get through it, then so many years are, you know, are forgotten, are, are, are passed by. So when we are involved in spirituality or in meditation or cultivating sadhana, we are in so to say, we are in a crash program because all of the negative things, or negative reaction that should have been uh, prolonged, that we should have come back to uh, and cure uh, for so many lifetimes. We, we are just going to be brushed through all of these things in this one life. So sometimes it could be very challenging. And we need to get some proper explication, some proper understanding, so that we don't get disturbed by what transpired. In as much as we have been ethical, we are following the path, we are following the standard that is laid down based on Guru, Sadhu, and Sastra. So we don't need to worry, okay? All right. Um, yes. So like, 
many times it so happens that we can that. That's what you are can give me the best part, the focus part, to even achieve. But then it personally happens. Then I'm like, like what does it even mean? Because now that I've achieved it, it doesn't make any sense. I don't get the same thing anymore. And in this whole process of achieving that goal, many times we even like compromise in our life with our parents, with any other message. We compromise on other stuff, like say, we might compromise on friends, we might compromise on anything. And then after achieving the whole thing, was it exactly, but not that very much. Not that I from not get it. That is how life is. We have insatiable desires. So you got a Rolls Royce. You got the Rolls Royce now. You be desire to get the Rolls Royce. You got the Rolls Royce after just a couple of days. It's nothing to you. Doesn't feel like anything. Doesn't feel like you have anything. That's how life is. That keeps us working hard, making more, <laughs> making more our efforts for more, more higher achievements. Otherwise. We would just be, you know, sitting back and not doing anything. That's the nature of life. And of course, when we get involved in cultivation of uh, southern about spiritual life, you know, that tendency of working so hard every day uh, becomes completely, you know, reduced. We focus on the essentials to be able to keep our lives going because we have already achieved uh, primary, our primary our goal and. Uh, it reduces the tension. And so it is possible that we have all of these type of situations. We are in these bodies. The bodies are meant for desires. <laughs> uh, when we even achieve the greatest desire we, we have, um, we've been thinking of, another thing will come up. We will neglect this. We will feel that this is nothing. It's natural, okay? So don't worry. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Okay. All right. <laughs> you give it a mic. Audience, please. I'm sorry. I have a multi-part question. Between you take a spiritual path and uh, and the mind which is choosing to uh, do vices. Second, which is choosing to work as the last thing? Following your vices. Yeah, vices, know. okay. So, how do you differentiate between choosing spiritual and taking the Ah, so let's take the last one. Choosing spirituality, if you're choosing spirituality, uh, basically, you means that you are practicing uh, spiritual sadhana. Uh, initially, you may have a material desire. You may have material intention for going for spirituality, but you get purified. I mean, it's like the case of Dhruva Maharaj in the, in the, uh, in the uh, Bhagavad Purana. Dhruva Maharaj, He's a uh, uh, stepmother offended him, and so he wanted to get a kingdom greater than that of his grandfather, or that greater than that of his father. So he went to engage in spirituality, went to do meditation in a forest, five years old boy. So he was so intense in his focus, in his meditation, in his spiritual development, and eventually Lord Vishnu appeared to him. He was purified enough that invoke Lord Vishnu. And uh, when Vishnu appeared to him, Vishnu asked him, yes, what can I do for you? Choose any benediction. You are here, a small boy, you are in the forest, meditating. What can I do for you? And Gruba, because at that time he was already purified, he said he didn't want anything. He, was, he said he was looking for broken bottles, but after seeing the Lord, he has become purified. He doesn't want any material thing from him. So, my point is, yes, people may go to spirituality for material reasons or for material motivation, but if they engage in spirituality, they become purified. And just like Druva, they, they, they become purified from the material desire. So it's a win-win game. What's the, what's the first point you raised? 
How did you know the difference to be defined? Okay. Okay. So the mind that is choosing spirituality uh, is basically due to what I would say is due to accumulation of pious merit. In Sanskrit, is referred to as krita punya punja, heaps and heaps of pious merits. All of you who are here, you have. You have accumulated lots of pious merit, and that is why you have a chance to become exposed to these very uh, exchanges today. So someone who is choosing, to, uh, choosing the path of spirituality is actually impaired by his own or her own spiritual credit from previous practices, from previous life, or this life, previous practices. The person who chooses the path of vices is also impaired by the reactions of his previous or her previous endeavors. And so we have a chance to do what is the needful, what will help us to grow, or what will help to uh, denigrate us 